Thank you for joining us for part two of the RAD site webinar, Cone Beam CT Imaging, Quality-Based Standards and Payer Reimbursement. Today's presentation will continue where we left off last week's webinar. If you have any questions, you can email RADSite at info at radsitequality.com and we will get a response from the presenters for you. I will now turn the presentation over to our moderator, Gary Carneal, RADSite President and CEO. Uh, thank you, Julie. Next slide. Uh, I thought that the first uh, part one was amazing and it was so substantive. We got through about uh, maybe 60% of the slides, so we wanted to do part two. Uh, this will also for the opportunity for us to answer or raise a couple of questions and answer them that was raised in the first webinar. So again, uh, welcome to our featured speaker, Christine Taxon. She's the founder and president of Link to Success, a dental management and consulting service firm that covers uh, dental and medical billing training. Uh, she's nationally known as a medical dental and billing specialist. So welcome back, Christine. Thank we also you. Have back, yep, we also have Dr. Siegel, who uh, is a professor and vice chair of the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Department of Diagnostic Radiology, as well as the chief of radiology and nuclear medicine for the Veteran Affairs Maryland Healthcare System. He also serves as RAD sites Chief Strategy Officer and as Chair of the um, uh, RADSITE Standards Committee. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the uh, last webinar was amazing. Uh, Christine really shared with us some really contemporary and key trends related to dental care. I think one of the major takeaways really was the uh, move towards uh, medical care integration, that dental care is really medical care and vice versa. And that actually has an impact on the use of cone beam CT uh, diagnostic imaging and how it's really taken off in the dental field and the medical field. Uh, Christine uh, really uh, provides some helpful insights in terms of the different specialty procedures and services uh, that are a byproduct or used along with cone beam CT imaging. And then she dove into some of the key billing processes uh, that are critical for any uh, provider to follow through, including uh, pre-authorization, um, the need to document uh, the process, really to listen to the patient, and much, much more. So, so pleased that we have both uh, Christine and Dr. Siegel back, and what we're going to do is start really where we left off last time. So next slide, Julie, and Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, Today, we're going to really dive deep into how to bill and why billing is important. Um, and I just wanted to know, Dr. Elliott, why are you surprised that even Medicare Advantage was part of Medicare, even though it's billed to private insurances? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so do you uh, have any questions there that you want to talk about first, or should we go? I, I, I think go forward, but it, it, it's been uh, great, and just really looking forward to the next slides and, and hearing more about this. Okay. Well, and, and I think, Christine, just to reiterate that, you know, in addition to everything you're providing, obviously, Rad Site's interest in this is it's offering the accreditation program that makes this all possible, so you need to get you need to have a MIPA approved accreditation and uh, RADSITE offers obviously the dental combi CT accreditation program, which was approved by CMS, and then also the first ever standalone medical combi CT accreditation program. So we're excited to be able to partner with you in really helping dental uh, providers and other types of providers take advantage of this exciting new technology. Well, that's what makes me excited because you are approved by Medicare. And anybody that is purchased or purchasing a CBCT scan should know that Medicare is usually the leader in all coding and billing and approval. And so by having both you and the doctor a part of Medicare Part B, even if you don't want to be an in-network provider, I'm really 
uh, emphasizing how important this is because you will be able to bill your patients for their office visit and their CBCT scan many more times because of the accreditation and the Part B coverage. So part, remember that Medicare is the boss of all other insurances. So the fact that Medicare Advantage plans are part of Medicare, that means that Oxford, Cigna, Aetna, all of the major players that have instituted the Medicare Advantage plan are now also going into the Medicare rules and regulations, which believe it or not, makes life easier when you know what to follow and how to follow it, you have less chances of anything going wrong. And that's really how I believe that this is a benefit. So in looking at the, the, the next slide, I just wanna show you a couple of things that you have to know in order to be able to bill. So the subjective, what did the patient tell you when they called? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an example. Uh, a patient, uh, I'll call him Jeffrey, uh, came into the office on an emergency. He had pain in his jaw when wasn't able to open and close it correctly. So the first thing that the doctor uh, provided, the oral physician, was to take his medical history. He also found that he had diabetes, high cholesterol, and took four medications for these illnesses. The doctor tried to do a clinical exam and the patient just could not open wide enough for him to do that. However, he was able to take a CBCT scan of both condyle bones to see if that was the issue. And how was he going to be? How was he going to be able to do a clinical and help him? So what they did was hot and cold packs, tensing, and the patient was then able to open his mouth large enough, open it wide enough for the doctor to do his clinical exam. This automatically becomes a medical necessity just from the patient showing up not being able to open and having this excruciating pain, plus all the other illnesses, the systemic illnesses that he is dealing with that may cause or add to this patient's oral cavity issues. What's the objective? The objective is what the doctor sees. The subjective is what the patient tells you and shows you whether it's swelling or not opening the jaw, the objective is what does the doctor clinically see and what diagnostic tests does he need to help this patient understand what's going on? Well, of course, because he couldn't do a clinical and he knew the patient was in pain and he knew that taking a CBCT scan could help him help the patient out of pain enough to do a clinical, he was able to order his CBCT scan, get it covered, and then provide diagnostic reasons for what he saw and how he took care of it enough to have the patient open their clinical and oral cavity wide enough. His assessment included seeing the patient in pain, not being able to open and close, by taking the medical history, understanding that the patient probably also had many, many issues of dry mouth because of the medications he was taking for both his diabetes and cholesterol. And that when he did open and close in the film, taking the film of the jaw bones, he was able to see the height and depth of the jaw bone and any bacterial infection present because of the coloring, so to speak. So his assessment was that this patient had um, inflammatory conditions of the jaw due to an abscess in the mouth and cysts of the jaw. 
So he was able to explain to the patient some of the functional impairment for this patient. That is not considered dental treatment. That is considered medical treatment if a patient is cannot function. So his condition in the maxilla required excision of infected bone in the maxilla. So how would he have treated this patient without that tool? That's really what I want to get to. So the assessment now is part of reading the film and making sure that it's being read as a radiologist. And there are plenty of radiologists that would do a, a, a reading of a film if the doctor is not comfortable doing it and documenting it. Uh, on an emergency basis. They do it for hospitals, they do it for medical, they do it for us. And then what is the treatment plan? And this doctor decided on his treatment plan, wrote it up, took that patient out of the pain that he was in, sent him home to think about the treatment plan, and then had him come back in and provide the treatment that was necessary. But what I want to give you in his plan were his diagnostic reasons for doing the treatment. He had a, an infection in the sinuses, J34.89. He had a cyst of the jaw, M27.40. He had cellulitis and inflammatory conditions of the jaw and the oral cavity, K12.2 and M27.2. And finally, he came in with jaw pain, which allowed us to get that CBCT scan pre authorized. And that was R68.84. We also diagnosed a patient with complications of the oral cavity as a diabetic, which is one code in the E category and dry mouth because of all his medications. So that is how you document your subjective, your objective, your assessment, and your plan. So let's go to the next slide. So what, what, how does this work? You know, what's the, the process of this? And so when I'm teaching offices, I really try to under, let doctors understand that there is a reason it's a little different for the dentist to document and put in what really is going on because we've gone from writing a book in school to text messaging in, med in the offices. You can't do that. So the important workflow is what is a radiology report? You need to learn how to write that up if you're not going to go to a radiologist to read. You need to know the reason for a CBCT scan, which we also need to write the reason for taking any test. It could be a PA, it could be saliva, it could be CBCT scan, but you must document why you ordered it. Why would you order a CBCT scan above all on this patient? Well, he couldn't even open his jaw to have a clinical exam. What your clinical notes state need to back up the reason for that CBC. And then the reading of the CBC will start you with the ability to give you the dentition, the jawbone, the sinus, uh, the cervical, and what other impressions and what if another CBC was done in comparison, because this is possible. Did he have a CBCT scan prior to coming in for a pain? And did we have the doctor or the radiologist look at both? That is also something that we're not asking, and it is something we should be asking. Because CBCT scans were approved for use, uh, believe it or not, by the Army and the federal government because before soldiers go to war, 
or when they join the Army, the Marines, whatever, they take a CBCT scan so that they have one on record, God forbid, that soldier or Marine or whoever gets damaged in war. So they can see how to put the pieces back together. So I want you to remember that because did this man have this prior and not take care of it? Was it not diagnosed? And or is it worse than it was prior? So we want to make sure those are your workflows on on your CBCT scan analysis when you get that report or when you write your report. And so, Christine, I, I guess this also implies that it's important when you do a cone beam CT scan to essentially keep a copy of the scan digitally or electronically. Absolutely. And, um, to, to store that for comparison. And if you know a patient's already had a cone beam CT scan in another office, to um, ask whether or not they have a mechanism to essentially write that to CD um, or some other uh, mechanism so that one can have it available for comparison. You know, I, I agree a thousand percent, but one of the things that I try to emphasize on the dental community, the oral physicians, is that if the patient says yes, that they had another CBCT scan, I always ask, you know, prior to the appointment uh, when they come in, so that if they did, the doctor that's referring them maybe could send a copy, or if a radiologist read it, you could contact that radiologist because they'll always have a copy of the report to share. So in the medical billing world, everything is online and we can access each other's information. But in the dental world at this point, we are not in that category. So it's important for us to know about this prior to taking one or at least getting it on this case as an emergency patient, at least getting a copy after we do see him, you know, um, right. it makes and, a big difference. Yeah, and then there's the report and the images, and I find the images themselves, in addition to the report, to be really helpful. So when one's purchasing a cone beam CT scanner, I think it's important to make sure that one has storage for, let's say, three years of, um, images or more and that's a question that one can uh, find out about and usually you can add additional storage to a uh, combi ct system so that you'll be able to have the prior studies for comparison um, of a study that was previously done in your own office yeah that's a very good point and i may bar i would like to borrow that thought <laughs> so <laughs> that's great because i think it's very important to do that you could go to the next slide. So people ask me, what are the codes? What are the codes? And the dental world came out with a lot of codes, just like they did for implant. And we need to look at this very carefully in order to choose what code am I doing and why am I doing it? But what I really want to point out is that the top code, the 70486 computer, computed tomography, the maxillofacial area without contrast is 90% of the film taken in the oral uh, physician's practices. And I would recommend that you know other codes that could be used besides that code. But for right now, what I want to show you is that the dental codes, even though they don't cover it on most plans, do cover the temporal mandibular joint some of the time under the dental or the tomography under the dental. But when you look at the cone beam capture and interpretation with limited field of view less than one arch or less than two arches or however it's written what i want you to know is that they never had read and the, the cbct taken and interpreted by the the oral physician they never broke it up so that if you send it to be read you can have it read by a radiologist and bill it separately. 
in the medical world, the code is the same, but you have to use modifiers. And we're going to go over that. But I do want to just emphasize that dental is moving closer to medical than they've ever done before in many arenas. That is because we are getting ready for the amount of changes in the insurance plans. Every year I go to meetings, it gets closer. Something else is changing to put the billing of medical into the dental billing. So even though these may not be covered by 90% of the plans in the dental world, they are used great for you to look up and know how do you cross code it and what they do done is make it cross codable by doing it this way because in the first set the comb beam capture and interpretation which means you're taking the film and you're reading the film which means you must document the reading of that film if you are not comfortable doing that or you don't want to spend time doing that, then you can send it to a radiologist to be read and he will send you a report, which then you keep in the patient's chart. Reports on everything that's diagnostic must be kept in the patient's records, whether it's a CBCT scan or saliva or oral DNA, it is part of that patient's medical record at this point. One other thing I just want to give you is that reading a film requires you to know how to read the type of film that you are taking. The scan, sorry, the scan. Because the scan, if you're billing 70486, you must include everything in that particular code. And you must know how to do that. So let's go to the next code. That's next slide. So the billing process. So here is just an example of uh, billing for taking and reading can be done by the doctor with just the code. However, if that's on your patient, you must write a detailed report. And if you are sending it to a radiologist, you can still bill for taking the film or you can bill for outside entities sending patients in to utilize your CBCT scan so that they are not your patients, they are just radiology patients. And the, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because if you have a certified credentialed facility, you are then able to do this. You are not able to do this if your facility is not a credentialed facility. If you do sleep apnea, think about sleep apnea. Sleep apnea makes you a durable medical equipment facility. It has nothing to do with the provider, so to speak. It's just that the provider has chosen to carry medical supplies. And medical supplies are under another part of a contract. The same thing with taking and reading film or taking for someone else outside of your office as a radiology facility, just like our OBGYN send us for a mammogram to a radiology facility, or we get sent for an MRI or a CBCT scan for our chest or any of the other areas that we take, we're going to a facility. Believe it or not, dentistry has put this in their offices, never realizing that you have to have that credentialing to actually back your facility. And I would like Gary to tell them about the advertising ability uh, with having that and the fact that it, it could be another business entity. So when you look at these codes, again, you're looking at how do you cross code a panel? 70255, how do you cross code a tomography? 
service survey 70330. This is exactly what the doctor on that emergency patient took because the patient couldn't open and close. He wanted a result right then and there for what he was looking at for the pain of the patient. So he did a temporal mandibular joint, open and closed mouth bilateral. He wanted good scanning evidence in that arena. But if you look here, D0364 is the capture interpretation with limited field of view. And when you're billing it, less than 70486, the technical component was only done. The doctor ended up sending it out. So I'm showing you this because I want you to see how important it is if you're going to cross code that not only do you look at the codes, this is a problem in dentistry, that you read the narrative along the code. You must make sure they match to choose the correct code. Okay? So this code, DO365, is the capture and interpretation. So again, DO365 would match up again to the 70486, and that would be TC. So take a look at all of these before you start billing. And if you need any help in understanding how to cross code it, uh, just give me an email and I'll help you answer that question. You could Christine, go to one, the... one point uh, that I wanted to underscore is the uh, fact that um, some practitioners elect to have a hybrid rapport where their area of expertise um, in the uh, dental arena is something where they would comment in a report on their observations, and then they may send it out for an overread where a radiologist might comment on the upper portion of the cervical spine that might be included in the image or the mastoid bones or the carotid or the circle of Willis um, circulation that is often included in some of the uh, you know more um, wide field of view images that are done. And the other thing I wanted to point out is you mentioned send it to a radiologist in your state, but there are many radiologists who do teleradiology for multiple states. And right. So um, I think many of the radiologists actually are credentialed in as many as 20, 30, 40, or, or even more states. So I think it's important that the radiologist that they send it to um, has among her or his credentials um, the ability to uh, to practice in that same state and right. um, increasingly uh, becoming the case with the uh, teleradiologists where um, they have uh, licenses to uh, practice in, in numerous states. And so really just wanted to put those two concepts um, forward. One is the fact that one could have um, the um, dental practitioner apply um, her or his expertise to that portion of it and then have a radiologist overread the other areas that are included in the image. And that radiologist uh, needs to have, uh, should have a license to practice in that same state among the um, one or more licenses that they have. So yeah. thanks. Absolutely. And that's something that's very important because there are states that already have this law on the book. Uh, yeah such as California and Minnesota and, you know, many states have this on their books already. So I always recommend that you go to your state society, whichever state you're in, and make sure you know those rules. I really try to keep up. And, it, you know, it's a changing um, dynamic all the time. So it's it's hard for any one person to keep up with every state. I try, but I recommend always go to your state board because you're missing out on a lot of things by not knowing what your state board can help you with as far as laws and all of that information. I do want to point out that one thing in the last code, the 70490, uh, a lot of orthodontists are now using that film because PEDO is specific uh, on the radiology uh, imaging. 
um, not to take a full CBCT on a child unless they absolutely have to. So they're doing computer tomography if the parent is filling out a form that lets them tend to believe that there's something going on with the child's airway, uh, either from temporal mandibula or sleep, because that becomes medical billing. And I just want to point out how specific that code is. And they're using it so they don't uh, have to take everything on the child. Now, if the doctor then needs something else, again, you could go back up and look at the computer tomography or the joint, temporal mandibular joint open and closed bilateral. That could help the doctor significantly when he's doing ortho for sleep or temporal mandibular. So it's okay to do that um, and, and then follow up with Dr. Elliot just went over. You could start your treatment and then have that full film read. Is that correct, Dr. Elliot? Yes, that, that, that's exactly right. And you know, you were mentioning differences in states. Um, I think it really is important to check with one's own state. For example, in California, I know for radiology um, CT non-cone beam studies, there's a requirement to uh, report out the uh, the dosage. And I know for cone beam uh, CT systems, they don't all report out that dosage associated with the study. So I think there are some you know uh, rules and regulations in particular states um, that may be specific to the state. So I think keeping up with those changing rules is really particularly important. Yes, very important on so many levels. So yeah. you could go to the next slide. So when you're taking and reading the imaging that you are providing on your own patient, you're taking it, the technical component, and you're reading it. Oh, what happened? Okay, good, good. And you're taking it and reading it for your own patient. You do not have to use a modifier. If you're only taking it and completely sending it out to be read, that's the professional component. So my modifier for taking the film is TC, if you're only taking it. If you're taking it and reading it for your patient, no modifier. However, I want to talk about the professional component 26. Most radiologists will charge the doctor for reading the film and they don't do the billing. And I have many um, doctors now working with the radiologists to read the film. They pay the radiologist and they have a contract that allows them to bill for reading it with their NPI number. So that's something I want you to think about. And actually at the meeting of the insurance extravaganza that both companies will be at, that is something that should be discussed because when you are working with one radiologist, he may say, yeah, that's something I'll do. He's getting paid anyway, but then you're able to get reimbursed. So it is something to seriously think about because a lot of oral physicians tend to not send it to a professional radiologist because they're laying out money for it to be read and they're not making any money because they don't know how to bill it. So it's a catch-22 and it's something that you can definitely work with a radiologist in, in reading your films and come up with a way, a contract, however you want to work it or they want to work it, because I see that happening more and more that they'll sign you up as a provider and they become your professional component. It just makes life easier and faster for the patient and the ability for you to be able to recoup that money. So that's what I want to say there. Could you go to the next slide? 
So what do you include in your report if you are reading it? And that's if even if you're reading it partially, as Dr. Elliot said, if you're reading it partially, then you still have to document. You must document. So let's go to the next slide so we could talk about what goes in it. So the clinical value, why are you taking the CBCT scan? You must give a reason for actually ordering the CBCT scan. Why did the doctor on my story earlier take a CBCT scan? Well, he could not even do a clinical, so we had to find out what was going on with the patient's jaw that he could not open it enough to get a clinical evaluation. What is the outcome of that CBCT scan? And then list the following areas that you need to read according to the film, the scan, I'm sorry, I keep saying film, the scan that you are providing. So let's say we're using a whole 70486 with everything in it, then you must document the dentition, the inclusion, the airway, the sinuses, the nasal area, the TMJ area, the spatal relationships, the C-spine, and then impression. What's the impression of the TMJ? What are you treating and why did you see, what did you see in this scan that helped you diagnose the patient so that the treatment would match the documentation. And this is another important reason for having it read. I truly believe that, you know, if I were not a diagnostic ICD-10 coder that's approved, I would not teach ICD-10 codes. If Dr. Elliot was not a radiologist, he wouldn't be teaching radiology and he wouldn't be talking about radiology and he would not be the head of radiology. So I always feel like you can get trained on reading it. There's many courses that you could take, but why not use a specialist when you are gonna deal with a patient like the one that I am talking about today who ended up needing a bone graft for the maxillary, excision of bone, osteoplasty. He used platelet-rich plasma, in the injections of the plasma. He took this CBCT scan to actually diagnose what he needed to do and ended up finding cysts in the jaw, uh, an axis of the mouth, and many other issues that needed to be addressed. So, why would we be able to build the CBCT scan if he didn't tell us why and if he didn't tell us what he got out of that CBCT scan? And that would come from his notes. So any questions here? Okay, let's go to Run the next for me. one. Thanks, that's really clear. Okay, so what's your clinical assessment? Once you read this, CBCT scan. So let's look at what this doctor wrote, okay? And I just want to go over it. So write up why you need the CBCT scan. In this case, the pain, patient was in pain, couldn't open and close his jaw. The study, per, the purpose, well, this particular one that we're looking at here has impactions and the sinus is involved. Write up the results of the scan. So what do you write up? Elongated right condyle, short left condyle, rule out DJD, dental issues. Patient reports no history of pain or injuries. Dentition, unerupted teeth, occlusion. The left side is a class two, but the right side posterior open bite and left side posterior vital, dental midline and mandible are shifted to the left. There is a small anterior open bite. Now, if you can't write that because you're not comfortable reading it, you made a, a big error and it could haunt you legally 
financially, and treatment planning that patient. Just right there for the occlusion. And that's something we do every day. The airway, what's the airway limits? Are they normal? The sinuses, well, I mean, you could have an infection in your, how many times has a patient come in thinking it was a abscess smola and it was a sinus infection? Or, or the patient went to an ENT and was sent and referred to you because the patient, the, the physician, the ENT doctor, saw that there was an abscess by the infection uh, by the sinus, but it was going into the molar up there. So there's many reasons for our collaborative work together. And CBCT scan has proven in many ways, along with sleep apnea, that collaboration on medical and dental is really going to grow more and more every year. What was the nose? There was nothing. What's the TMJ? He documents it. What's the relationship? The closed position, the condyle, the mandible, the maxillary, the C-spine, and then impressions. Now, what I would like to say is the impressions are a whole combination of everything that you did see. So if you do something, as Dr. Elliott mentioned, just reading exactly what you needed for that patient right then and there and not read the whole report, then you must write up what you did read. So whatever, you still have to write what type of film, what did you see, the dentition, the occlusion. If you don't know how to read the airway, then leave it to the specialist. If you're not 100% comfortable reading the sinus, which I, you know, you should be, but you should have the ability to document it, the nose and the TMJ, all of it. If you're going to send some of it out, then I would wait to build personally and have it all together. That would be my recommendation. It's kind of like sending an oral DNA out to a lab or a sleep apnea appliance out to a lab. You really can't bill until you place it. So do the same thing with the CBCT scan. Hold off, read what you need, maybe start treatment, especially on someone that's an emergency, and then have the rest read and documented by someone. That's also a choice. So you could move on. And before we move on, if you could just go back just to one side, I just had a couple comments. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so um, one thing, I, I really like the idea that you're showing a, a template. And I think anyone who's doing um, interpretation of uh, you know one of these scans, uh, um, clinical uh, studies, really should have a template, and then that template is something that could be uh, filled out. But I think if you have the template, it increases the likelihood that you won't forget to talk about a particular component, and it'll establish a pattern for you as well. The, the second thing I wanted to comment on was um, H, uh, C-spine. When it says no significant abnormalities are noted, one thing that's really important is to actually talk about the cervical uh, vertebrae that are included in the exam. And so in many of these exams, you may see, say, the first three or four cervical vertebrae, but you won't see the entire cervical spine. And so you don't want to essentially, you know, um, imply that there are no abnormalities of the cervical spine at all, because there could be um, in portions of the cervical spine that you're not seeing. So I would just say, um, that the uh, first uh, you know, four cervical vertebrae are included in the study and no significant abnormalities of those are noted. And that way it won't look as though you're commenting on the entire cervical spine. Some will say no significant abnormalities in the visualized cervical spine, but I think rather than making it vague, it's helpful to actually um, indicate you know, how many vertebrae you're actually uh, able to, uh, to visualize. That's so, a uh, really thanks, good that's really good. Is that possible, Dr. Elliot? I have this template that I use when I'm teaching CBCT scan and 
and all of this, but is it possible for you to help me put together maybe like a little cheat thing in there, like so that they could document what they did see if there was sure. one? Yeah, I, I would be really happy to work with you, uh, maybe during or, or after the conference that you're having to try to put something together that might be you know, one example of a template that, that people could use. I'm sure others will be able to improve on that also, but I think it's a terrific idea to have a sample template. I think this slide gives a pretty good um, uh, idea of what that template might be, but I think uh, one could come up with a, uh, a uh, uh, even improved uh, template that could be um, used in some of the uh, um, reporting systems. So uh, happy to follow up with you about that, Christine, thanks. That would be great. I, I think that you know anything we could add to help a doctor uh, become the and have the ability is really uh, significant in helping them even be able to explain it to the patient. You know, a lot of doctors ask me, does the patient get a copy of the report? Well, everything in their chart, they are allowed to see. So if you're going to just document the way you document with text messaging, the patient's not going to be very happy. And if they do have a film somewhere else, say they're traveling and they fall or get hurt or their jaw locks again, and the, the patient tells the doctor they're seeing, well, I had a CBCT scan at this office, but you don't have this right now. That is really where it gets messy. And that's why this template is really, really important. So, Great. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So let's go. So I just wanted to show you an example of a payment for treatment within a dental practice. This is medical now. So what I'm showing you is um, the treatment that was provided. So I know what the treatment is and I'm not allowed to put the whole thing up there. But what I did want to show you was the fact that you can put, this is an implant case, okay? And this implant case, this doctor charged 10,000 and he did more than, he did one unit for 10,000 but he was disallowed a certain amount, but the patient had to pay deductible. And so the coinsurance also has to be paid by the patient. So the deductible and the coinsurance and the remaining balance for the patient was needed to be paid, but the insurance also paid a portion of it. So when you look at certain claims, you're going to see CBCT scans. Now, why am I showing you something that doesn't have one? Because there is one here. This is a CBCT scan. It was billed at 4,500, which I think is a little too high. They contracted charges. They were allowed 3,600. They disallowed 900. So the co-payment and the remaining member expense was 672 and the insurance paid the balance. So even at really high fees, the insurance covers some of it. The patient always has to pay their deductible. And one of the things doctors ask me all of the time, and this is why I'm showing you this EOB is, well, what do I say if they have a high deductible? Well, if you are doing this case at this dollar amount and that's what your fees are, and who am I to say what your fees are? Those are your choices. Whatever you get paid by the medical is a help to your patient, every part of it. So you have to look at the difference. If the patient is gonna get $4,196 on this 10,000, then they couldn't get that in medical. Even on the, the CBCT scan, they're getting 1480. 1480, that's a lot of money. And so you have to look at 
what am I getting, which would never get covered under the medical, it wouldn't get covered, I mean, under the dental. So you're always going to have happy patients, always. Now, I'm not saying bill an exorbitant fee just to get it, because that's not fair either. But there are ways to look up your fees within a program online and or use a company that really knows that you're billing medical so that they can help adjust your fees because you cannot have two fee schedules. You cannot be charging 10000 because it's medical and only 4000 if it's dental. So you have to work with someone who understands the dynamic of medical billing and dental billing together and keeping within the laws and keeping your fees in line because you're only allowed one fee plan, one fee schedule. The schedules from the insurance are not your private fee schedule. It's different. So I hope that helps. I think we have another one in here that we could look at at the next slide. This is where you could go online. I only looked up at a network reimbursement, but everybody can use this because I use it to show my patients. It's fairhealthconsumer.org. Fairhealthconsumer.org. It's not a professional doing it, but at least you could get a roundabout fee. But you're looking up the medical. So you could see here C CT scan of face and the CPT code was 70486, which is the full scan. And the total provider charge, he said in the 90th percentile, you put in whatever percentile you want to be in. And I think it's from 40 to 100. Um, and the typical plan will pay 90%. So the ad and network uninsured price would be 4,164 and the insurance may pay this and then the out of pocket is 416. But this is very important to remember. Every fee for the same code is gonna be different because of the zip code you're in. So if you look here, I have a New York zip code. New York has some of the higher fees available and some of the higher fees reimbursable, but they also pay, like California, some of the highest rents. So you may look at this and say, wow, you know, that's a lot of money. And it is a lot of money. But what you have to remember to put a CBCT scan in a New York office or a California office, they need space. And space is very costly. And the insurance companies know it. So I want you to really think before you set your fees and make sure you're putting in your zip code, not using this as a template. I'm just giving you examples. I can't tell you what to charge. This is also an ad a network, UCR, and what Medicare would cover if you had Part B, Medicare, at a network. The CT scan of the face, 70486, still in a New York zip code. Typical provider charge, $3,885. Typical plan will pay $3,497. Medicare, typical provider charge, $3,800. Medicare will cover 137 and the out-of-pocket fees are right here. So you can really see the differences of what you could get and what you can't. But I'm going to just give you one example of why I recommend Part B so much. This 137, in most cases, with a patient that's 65 or older, whether they have Medicare Advantage or Medicare, that fee is going to be different according to the type of plan. Regular Medicare will pay that. Medicare Advantage plans are going to go under 
an umbrella under a private insurance company, Aetna, Cigna, whatever it may be. So those fees will differ according to your zip code. Again, Medicare fees go according to your zip code. Everything you buy is according to your zip code. So I just really want to emphasize your zip code and the types of plans you're working with or and the, the percentage that you're charging all work into coming up with these fees. You could go to the next slide. So right. I love working with you, Dr. Elliot, and I know that you're gonna really help so many people with this training and certification program. Well, thanks, the privilege is mine actually, and I learn a tremendous amount every time I I hear you speak and thanks for the um, thoughtful presentation and the thoughtful answers to, to those questions too. And I'm really looking forward to uh, collaborating with you. Yes, well, I am too, so. Well, could we have a, a couple of questions uh, from the uh, webinar part one? Um, so Dr. Siegel, do you have any other kind of closing comments or we can just jump right to the questions? Yeah, no, um, I think I um, gave those, so I think we can go right to the questions. Thanks, Gary. Right, great. Well, uh, Christine, uh, again, extremely helpful and insightful. Uh, one of the, uh, we received a couple of questions really regarding about the relationship between your reimbursement, um, consulting services, and RAT side accreditation. Let me take a first uh, step at describing that, and then you can provide a color commentary. But RADSITE is one of four recognized accreditation organizations by CMS. Uh, RADSITE also for its traditional um, advanced diagnostic imaging and accreditation program is recognized by over 350 payers, pretty much every payer that we're aware of. Um, so basically, as a ticket of entry, you do need to have accreditation pursuant to Christine's comments. Um, and just to give you a flavor of the uh, scope of our accreditation program, uh, which you can learn more about at our next webinar or go to some of our on-demand webinars or download our standards. But we basically have five or six buckets. Basically, we ask for information about the imaging provider, dentist's office, ENT, the dietrist, et cetera. Um, we then offer, we ask basic information about the comb beam CT imaging system. And then pursuant to CMS requirements, we uh, talk or we ask a little bit about key professional staff, both their qualifications and responsibilities, such as the clinical director in charge of the practice, the interpreting practitioner, which may be in-house or may be a radiologist at a house or some sort of hybrid scenario. Uh, we then ask questions about the imaging technologist. That's the person pushing the button. Uh, we, talk, we ask uh, certain questions about the imaging manager, the person running the practice. Uh, there's also a requirement that one of the staff be an imaging safety officer. Uh, and, uh, and then also uh, the physicist who's typically a third party consultant uh, coming in to do the technical component. Uh, some of these positions can be overlapping and held by the same person, but we do have basically an infrastructure. In addition, we have requirements about certain written policy and procedures and quality assurance. And finally, a technical component that talks about really um, uh, submitting some images uh, pursuant to the comments today in our, our part one, really looking at how the documentation works, how the report is written, the quality of the images. Uh, RATSITE uh, pursues an educational approach, so when there's deficiencies, we, we communicate back to the applicant and give them a chance to make those corrections. So RATSITE's kind of domain is really the uh, workflows and the structures around the imaging equipment and the staff and looking at the quality of uh, the images and also making sure that the equipment is, is properly calibrated from time to time. Christine's area is really more about the reimbursement, but you can't get to the reimbursement really until you have the accreditation. So we're working kind of in a symbiotic way with, with Christine. We're separate, but working together because you need really both sides of the equation to um, basically optimize your practice. First and foremost, it's about the patient, making sure they're getting the right image at the right time for the diagnostic purposes, potentially both before and afterwards, but then also working with Christine to make sure you get uh, paid for that imaging and for the, treat the services you're providing. 
Christine, what did I miss out in terms of the relationship between what we're doing and what you're doing? Well, I think that most people that buy a CBCT scan, and I've been doing this for a long time, have no idea that they should have it credentialed for many reasons. And my firm belief is that having it credentialed the same way as sleep apnea offices are credentialed is that you have another business entity within your oral practice, which allows you then to do things for other offices. And to me, that's a win-win. Secondly, if you don't know everything that you're teaching, then billing is a problem. And if you're billing, say, Medicare without having a, a certified facility, then Medicare is going to see that you're not certified. Now, in the medical world, I just want to make this clear, as in the dental world, Big Brother is watching. There, every form that goes in, whether you are submitting it or the patient is submitting it, your NPI number is on it. So they know more about you than you probably even know about yourself. And to me, I like to cross my eyes and I mean, cross my T's and dot my eyes in the right way so that when I'm telling a doctor anything about billing, I feel like knowing what the rules and the regulations and the laws are prevents any surprises. And I'm not good with surprises. So I don't want them to be good with surprises either. Great. And of course, it's, I mean, it's so important uh, in the same way that you've uh, talked about the integration of uh, dental with medical care. I think what the accreditation part is doing is level the playing field as well so that uh, the Cobain CT imaging system, which is advanced diagnostic imaging equipment, is also held to the same standard as traditional medical care. So it really is a level of playing field. And then to your point, the reimbursement also should be leveled out over time so that uh, dentists or other Cobain CT imaging providers are receiving pro you know, appropriate payment for the services they're rendering. So that's very helpful. Christine, can you tell us a little bit, we had a couple of questions related to how they really engage you for your services. So you mentioned in brief, you have uh, some online webinars, you have the big conference coming up in Orlando, knowing that this webinar will be, um, you know, available for the next uh, 12 months or so on RATSAC's website. What is the best way to get in contact with you and to kind of basically learn about your services? Um, well, they could go to the school platform, uh, that I have, which is dentalmedicalbilling.com. There's a lot of videos talking about CBCT scans. I have a book that I wrote. I, you have a copy. It's just being updated for this year's new codes. So all of the credentialing information that uh, we talk about is in there with your certification. And I, I just want to put in one thing about why working with your company is different than anybody else's. Working with you is allowing the dentist who hates paperwork have somebody help them. And you're the only company that does that. And I know that the doctors will be more compliant when they had somebody that could help them through it. That's why when I teach hands-on, I'm there with a smaller group of people and I'm working with you, not as a lecture. Lectures are not training. Hands-on are training. And that's what you provide. Not No other company does that. And I just want to tell everybody, when you learn hands-on, that's when you're learning. When you learn in a lecture, that's an idea. That little, see that little light bulb? Oh, I could do that too. But training is an individual thing. So I do individual training. I do smaller hands-on. I'm actually going to be doing one sometime in January or February, my uh, hands-on in person where people come for two days. 
they bring their own claims, they get set up before, and um, we just kind of handhold them. We make sure their first claim is looked over before it's sent in. We do a lot of that handholding, which a lot of other people don't do. That, that's the difference. I'd rather work with less people and achieve a higher level than work with more people just to get them in the door. That's how I feel. That's great. And of course, Brad side feels the same way in terms of the uh, aspect related to the image quality, the workflows again, the you know calibration of the equipment. So really our, our two services are complementary of each other. So we're excited about being able to work uh, with you. Um, and it sounds like it's something worthwhile to just to you more directly to learn about not only billing, but things such as the pre-authorization uh, process. It can be pre pretty intimidating, I think, um, at first in terms of understanding the managed care workflow processes. So just a final comment, and I'll turn it back over to Julie, but this uh, webinar is obviously for educational purposes. So please do feel free to uh, reach out to Christine on reimbursement issues and certainly RADSITE on accreditation. I want to uh, extend again my thanks for Christine uh, with her ability to really kind of almost humanize kind of this complexity of billing. And uh, Dr. Siegel, thank you for kind of providing some clinical insights and observations along the way. So very, very exciting. You'll be probably hearing more from Christine through uh, future Routesite uh, educational programs and perhaps some other blogs or things like that. So uh, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. Julie, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Uh, I, can I just say one other thing? I mean, sure. um, if Dr. Siegel and I put together some things and and uh, we could do another webinar where it's really just about the billing with the certification that the doctor obtains with you with PACE CE credits also available. All my courses are PACE certified and the billers can become credentialed, certified medical CBCT scan coders. Just so everybody knows. Great, thank, thank you, Christine. Uh, Julie? Sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Um, just a reminder, these are the um, contact information. So jot that down. Um, but if you do have any questions, feel free to email them to radsite at info at radsitequality.com. And we will be sure to get a response from the presenters for you. And if you enjoyed today's presentation, we have two more webinars scheduled. The first is RAD sites on RAD site standards and accreditation updates, the 2021 annual update and what to expect in 2022 on Wednesday, November the 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And the second upcoming webinar is promoting the patient experience through the integration of leadership values a spotlight on outpatient imaging centers featuring David J. Waldron, CEO of Traction Business Development for Wednesday, December the 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We hope you enjoyed part two of the webinar and we hope you'll come back soon and we'll sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Gary?